Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. How's it going? Good. It's good to see you guys. Uh, If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me in it to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to jump in together. Incidentally, it's great to see you guys. Fun to be back with family. Our ushers are coming forward now with Bibles. If you don't have a Bible or you know someone that doesn't have a Bible and you want to give them one, please take one of those. You're welcome to steal our Bibles this morning. Those are for you. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9, says this. As Jesus passed on from there, a man called Matthew was sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in his house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. If you guys would pray with me. Well, Lord, um, we step into this moment, and God, I ask that you would give us a sense of awe and of reverence in your presence. God, I pray as we step in to worship you through the reading and teaching of your word that you would come and you would speak to us, God. I feel my inadequacy to present the things that you have for us today, and so I ask that you would be with me, you would speak through me, and your presence here uh, would enliven and enlighten hearts. God, might we delight to be in your presence and in the presence of your people. And God, I pray that as we look at the things that you have for us this morning, that we would come with with a humble mind and a tender heart. And God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room this morning with a hard heart, that you would graciously break that heart, God. And I pray if there's anyone in the room with a broken heart, that you would come and you would graciously heal it and be comfort and be love to them. God, we're asking that you the God of the universe, would step into our world. And so we're praying for miracles and we're asking for big things, but we trust you to do it. And we pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, I'm from Houston, Texas, and I consider myself a true Texan. My first summer job out of college was working in the oil field as a labor hand. I grew up watching the Rockets play basketball, the Texans play football when I was little. I even had the accent. We have a home video of me running down an embankment and then just wide-eyed looking full into the camera and saying, that's a big heel. And that was just me. That's how I talked. And so it was a major adjustment for me moving from Texas to the heart of New England, to Boston, Massachusetts, where they don't watch the Texans play football. They watch Tom Brady deflate footballs. And if you consider making a joke about that, they'll consider taking your life, right? They take it very seriously there. And if you say the word y'all where I live, they look at you like you are a backwater, backwoods, low IQ bumpkin, okay? And so it was a bit of an adjustment for me. For the first time in my life, I had to learn to adjust to being a cultural minority, sort of being a resident alien. I don't quite fit in here, right? Uh, And I mention that to you because that's where we are in the story of Christianity, in the story of Christianity, especially in our country. And I wouldn't normally do this to you, but I just finished my first year of seminary, and I want to geek out for just a second on history. That's okay with you guys. Yell up for that? Thank you. Uh, So if you don't know this, you live in an incredibly unique time in Christian history. Uh, If you don't know your history, let me give you a sweeping overview. For the first 300 years of Christianity, at all times, Christians were misunderstood and seen as outcasts. And much of the time, for the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians were intensely persecuted for their faith. They worshipped in secret, and they worshipped in hiding, this little fledgling group as they were pursuing and worshipping Jesus until the year 300, around then, the emperor Constantine, the Roman emperor, the leader of the world at the time, claimed Christianity. Uh, And for the first time in Christianity, it was advantageous economically, politically, socially, to claim Christianity. People flocked in droves to what became known as Christendom, or the church running the state. That developed full scale into the Middle Ages and the Holy Roman Empire, and that develops all the way into American history. And we've gone through the Reformation, so it looks different, but you have all these little dissenting groups that want to worship as they please. And some of their motivation was 
uh, monetary, but some of their motivation, much of their motivation was uh, worship. They wanted to come worship how they pleased. And so they wrote into the foundation of our country, wove into it the principles or the morals of our Bible. They, they weren't all Christians. Some of them were deists, but nonetheless, they held to the principles of our Bible. And so for the first 300 years of Christianity, culture took its cues from this morality. And so what was acceptable to put in a song, what was acceptable to wear, what was acceptable to put in print, that came from the church. And now, for the first time in Christian history, we are slipping away from, we're moving away from this idea of Christendom or the church overseeing and governing the state. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's fascinating that we're, we're moving back into what looks like the origins of Christianity. And we're having to adjust to learn to be a cultural minority. And for those of you who, as I say that, your head sort of spin, you think the sky's falling and that makes you uncomfortable, let me just say that statistically, evangelical Christianity is on the rise. We're not dying out here. Mainline traditions, as they fall, uh, evangelical Christianity rises, and so Christianity is sort of polarizing. If you want to know more about that, hear the statistics of it and how that all plays out, tune into Postscript. I'll address all of that. But for the rest of us, we just need to know that for us, we're slipping into a cultural minority. No longer does culture take its cues from us. And so my question is, how do we engage with a culture that now looks at us like they looked at those early believers? Uh, As misunderstood, as outcasts, and even as potentially hostile towards us. How do we engage with the culture around us? And there are a couple ways we could talk about that this morning. And the first is that we could talk about it conceptually. How do we internalize this new information and think about it rightly as we conceptualize our subculture interacting with the larger culture? But we're not going to do that. Uh, The reason is because Ben Stewart in his talk two weeks ago, Chaos and the King, covers that beautifully. I would encourage you to go back and watch that. Google the name Dr. Russell Moore. Read anything that he's done. Read the book of 1 Peter like 20 times. It'll give you a window into how to conceptualize and internalize this information. We're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it the other way that we can deal with it. And that is by talking about not necessarily how to think about it hypothetically, but how to engage practically. And so how do we engage one-on-one with other people in our culture who think differently, who act differently, and whose lives are contrary to the gospel that we know and understand? Uh, Now, what do I mean by that? Let me put it to you this way. When I moved to Boston uh, uh, last fall to start seminary, I took a job uh, out in the community. I realized at the end of my time at FaithBridge that I didn't have any relationships with anyone that didn't really think exactly like me. I didn't interact regularly with any non-Christians, and so I thought that is a trend that needs to stop. And so I started working at this little store that was right next to my seminary, and I worked with some pretty rough dudes. Uh, Mike, one of my coworkers, is famous on YouTube for bar fights. Uh, You can go look him up, White Horse Tavern, it's insane, right? Uh, My boss is an old Navy guy, uh, so he's kind of this crusty old sailor that's interested primarily and really uh, exclusively in one of three things, money, women, and dirty jokes. If you bring up something that doesn't fall into one of those categories, he's like, I don't even, what are you talking to me right now for, right? He's just only interested in those things, and these are the people that I work with. And for them, Christianity, if you don't know this about our culture, they say that New England follows the culture of Europe. And so it trickles in from England. And you can look 50 years into England's past and see where we will be currently. And then that trickles from England down down into New England, down into the Bible Belt. And so we follow the culture of Europe. We're just behind them. And so what I do is when I'm in Boston, I get a little bit of a window into what our future is going to be like in the Bible Belt. Because they say spiritually, we follow them. And if you don't know this, spiritually, it's very dry up there. There aren't churches really like this. Very rarely, most mainline denominations are dead and or dying, and they see Christianity as largely obsolete and a relic, something of the past. So when they found out that not only was I a practicing Christian, but that I went to the seminary, that blew their minds. They said, we've been here for 30 years. We've never met anyone from that school. And they just started watching me. And, uh, and that became sort of a daily thing. But the other thing that you need to know about my boss is for him, there are only real, two real motivations. Money and how to get more of it and women. And I'll just leave it at that. And he thinks for me that I'm a priest. I've tried to explain to him that's not how it works. But for him, women are off the table for Mike. And so he assumes that I'm in ministry for money. And so he looks at me and he thinks not only is this guy a practicing Christian of a relic of an obsolete religion, he's a crook. Because he doesn't see it as real. He looks and he says, that's a person that just wants to make easy money. 
He wants to go sell a lie, capitalize on the, on the ignorance of people, and pass the plate and get a check. And so they treat me as such. And it's not always fun. I become the brunt of jokes at times. I become mocked for the things that I believe. It's not always like this, but oftentimes I'll be coming up from the basement with a box and I'll see my boss with one of his favorite customers or one of his sales representatives and they'll be laughing and can't believe it. And I'll come up and I'll find out that I'm the brunt of that joke. And it's not fun. It's not fun. And so how do I engage them? How do I engage these people that don't understand me and that are even sometimes hostile towards me? How would Jesus want me to respond? How do we respond to people that don't buy into our life or our way of living? Uh, And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at Jesus and his interaction with the tax collector as a model for how we engage. And so we're picking up in Matthew chapter 9, and rather than just start into it, let me give you a tiny bit of context because we're in a literary masterpiece. The theme of this book, the thing, theme of the book of Matthew, what he wants you to most understand about Jesus is that Jesus came as king. The phrase that's repeated over and over again in this book is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus says it. His disciples repeat it. The kingdom of heaven is here. And for the first four chapters, chapters one through four, we learn about his person. Who is this king? In chapters five through seven, we learn about his principles. What is he about? And in chapters eight through 10, where we find our passage this morning, we learn about his power, how he backs up with authority, the things that he is and the things that he proclaims. He has incredible authority over nature, over sickness, and even over men's hearts. And so Jesus comes and he says, I am the anticipated Messiah. And so the Jewish people, they would have looked at Jesus and they'd say, okay, here's the Messiah. So we expect two things from our king. We expect our Messiah to come and relieve us of all who oppress us, namely, at that time, the Romans. And also to relieve us, the second thing is, of those who side with our oppressors and live contrary to the word of God. And those people in the second category most prominently were tax collectors. Tax collectors at this time were seen as traitors because they sided with the Romans. The Romans would come in, lay down the law, and they would say, look, we want taxes from these people. So they would hire locals, and they would say, you know where everyone lives. You know how much money they make. You go collect our taxes for us. We want X amount of dollars. Whatever you take over the top, that's just to sweeten the deal. You go do it. And so the tax collectors, their greed was such that they didn't mind teaming up with their oppressors to steal money from their family from their brothers, from their neighbors. They were filth, and they were seen as such by their people. Now, Matthew, that's who he is. Matthew was seen as representative of those people who were responsible for the degradation or the unraveling of the Jewish society. So how does Jesus respond? How does he engage with this man? What do we do? What do we do? How do we engage with people around us whose lives contradict all that we hold dear and threaten to undo our way of living? Jesus' answer, we go out and meet him and we invite him in. We take him to dinner. Let me explain what I mean. I think our temptation when we come face to face with this issue is to really do one of two things. And the first is just accommodate, to compromise morally. And we say, it's okay, man, you do you, you know, only God can judge, right? You live life how you feel good about it. And we um, make space for things that our Bible will call sin. The second response, the natural response that comes up in the heart of humanity is to rise up and go to war. We don't lay down and accommodate. We come in hard. And we'll shame them. We'll publicly bash them. We'll write articles where we compare them to Duck Dynasty's daughter and say, she's such a whatever. And we just call them horrible things. Or we write chain emails to all our friends and say, if we don't stop these people, this is what's going to happen. We got to take these people down. And we lose our minds. We get fearful. And we get mean. And I think it's interesting that psychologists will say that the number one cause or the primary cause of anger is the feeling of losing control. And so when Jesus comes face to face with this man who threatens to undo the entire way of living for his people, how does he engage him? What does he do? Does he go to war? Does he explode? Does he rise up? That's what they would have expected. The Messiah's here. He's going to start low and he's going to work his way up to the Romans. He is about to drop the hammer. That's what they expect in this moment. What does Jesus do? He's totally unflappable completely calm. 
and he steps towards this man with love. And I want to play a video for you uh, depicting how this may have gone down. I read you Matthew's version earlier. I want to show you this version. Rather than me read it to you again or tell you about it, I'm going to let this model that they chose to play Jesus show you. So what's the first thing Jesus does? In that video, what does attractive Jesus do? He steps towards him, right? He he extends his hand in a show of grace. The first thing that Jesus does, what does Jesus do when he comes face to face with those whose lives threaten to undo our way of living and are entirely contrary to our morality? The same Jesus who just preached the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most moralistic religious treaties ever uttered. He ups the ante. He, he focuses it on the heart of the Old Testament. How does this Jesus respond to Matthew? Jesus is going to do two things that give us a model for how we engage with the world around us that I want to look at real quickly. And the first thing that Jesus does is he invites him to be with him. He invites him to be with him. In verse 9, Jesus passed on from there, And he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Jesus extends his hand and says, step into my world. A great example of this. Uh, When I was up at seminary last semester, uh, one particular day I was talking to Michael Sullivan, the current young adult pastor on the phone, and was just asking him, hey man, how's everything carrying on? How's the ministry? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I want to tell you all about that in a second. But first let me tell you this story. It's crazy. And I said, okay, tell me. And so he started relating to me this story about a young man named Louis, who's a good friend of mine. I flew home in January to officiate the wedding of his and his now bride, who incidentally, both of them met as interns at Disney. So that gives you a little bit of a window into their gregarious, fun, hospitable personalities, and their wedding was off the chain, all right? Uh, They did a a choreographed dance with their mothers to Uptown Funk, and I was like, that's what I'm talking about. It was awesome, right? Uh, I don't know why I told you that. Anyways, uh, so this man, Louis, steps into HEB one day, and he meets a young man uh, who just looks kind of down. He steps into his world, he engages him in conversation, he asks him about a tattoo that's on his arm, and, and this guy starts telling him a little bit about his life, and it was just easy to tell something wasn't right, and found out eventually that he had just moved to Houston as a restart. Found out later that the only two numbers in his phone were that of his mother and his father, and he said his only friend was a bottle. Just felt incredibly alone. And so Louis, when he heard this, wasn't freaked out by it, didn't look down on him, and didn't judge him. He just said, hey, man, why don't you come in to Faith Bridge? Why don't you just come check out this church? And uh, so he came. He started getting plugged into the young adult ministry, started tracking with them and going to a small group, started to see what it was to walk with God and with the people of God, went to a small group where they taught him how to write out their testimonies or their stories with the Lord. So he started wrapping his mind around where do I stand with the Lord and just progressed through this for about a month until his court date came up and his old legal troubles caught up with him. Got the bad end of that and ended up having to serve some time. When he didn't show up for a couple of events, the young adults figured that's probably where he was. He had been very open about his history, so they organized a group to go meet him and to go hang out with him and just see how he was doing. And they put a schedule together where they would go regularly. But the first time that they got there, they found that he had already started a Bible study in jail, that they'd shared with him how to share his testimony. So he started sharing Jesus with the people in prison, and he'd put a calendar up on his wall when their court dates would come up, and he'd bring him in and pray for him, making an incredible impact on the kingdom in jail made it through that and is now incredibly faithful and plugged in to our young adult ministry. And when Louis saw that guy and saw him as different and saw him as in trouble and alone, he didn't go, that's weird, and move on. He looked at him and he said, hey, man, come on. Come on. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it's for you. It's for you. This is why Jesus came. And so for us, when we encounter people that look different to us, that threaten to unravel our society, that live contrary to our morals, how do we respond to them? To the person that you may look at and say, they're on the wrong side of the political spectrum. Or you may look at them and you say, that person is a bigot. Or you look at them and you look at it and you hatefully call someone a thug. You say, that's who these people are. What's Jesus' response to you for how you deal with them? You invite them in. You invite them in. What's the second thing that Jesus says to do? Jesus graciously then steps into his world 
The first thing we do is we invite them in, and the second thing we do is we graciously step into their world. And in verse 10, as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And D.A. Carson, one of the foremost evangelical scholars alive today who wrote the commentary on this book said what Jesus is doing is he's attending a party. He's reclining at table with tax collectors and with sinners, namely thieves, prostitutes, etc. Jesus is there in their world. I remember when um, we were first starting the young adult ministry at Faith Bridge, uh, we were tracking along and we had like four people after five months and I felt like a failure, but that's just an aside. There was one man though, one young man who started coming who was a jujitsu trainer sort of tracked in that world and trained some guys and that sort of thing. And he started coming to the ministry. And before he came, though, he came to Faith Bridge on a Sunday morning and heard a sermon that he was like, I didn't even know what happened. I just started weeping. And he was like, well, can't show my face there anymore. And uh, so he started going to the young adult ministry. And when he was there, he met the Lord. Radical transformation in his heart. God met him and it changed everything about him. And he wanted to tell everybody about it. So he started inviting all of his friends. And our ministry doubled and tripled because of the people that he invited. And we had this little ragtag group of people that you would never expect to see at a church, but they would come to this moment where we would worship in this little house. And I remember a couple of the guys that were there were, were UFC guys. They were training for UFC or running in that world. And at that time, we met in a little house and we had a piano in the living room and we had a cello and a violin. And we had this sort of mellowed out worship where if you love Jesus, it was awesome. But if you didn't, it was weird. And uh, I remember those guys would sit there and they're these tough, tatted up dudes and they would just sit there and they had their arms folded and they looked frankly mad. They were like, what is this? They couldn't even look up, right? And I remember they would come week after week though and they would invite me to go to the gym with them. And I thought, you know what? They come to my thing every week, I'll go to theirs. So after Bible study one night, I rounded up a few of my leaders and we went to the gym and we fought each other and I broke my foot. Um... (laughs) I went to the doctor the next morning. I'll never forget this. He was pushing on the bones and I was screaming and he was like, yep, just as I suspected, you broke your dancer's bone. And I said, excuse me? And he said, yeah, this is the bone that most dancers break when they, you know, fall. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's my fighter's bone, sir. Uh, Let's get one thing straight. Uh, I was at the gym last night, I promise, right? Uh, but I remember one night we kept doing that. That kind of became a thing in our ministry and we called it man night. We would like watch Gladiator, eat meat and fight each other. And that's just what we did. And I remember one night in particular, there was this, uh, this guy that had spent some time in prison. This is becoming a theme for us. Uh, and he, he came with us that night and uh, I, that, that, that night got a little bit out of control. I don't know how this happened, but we ended up getting a uh, frozen yogurt on man night. But uh, I remember being there and this guy looked at us and he just said, I never knew Christians could be cool. And we weren't out there talking about each other's mothers and getting smashed and compromising anything morally of what we held dear and true. But he looked at us and he said, you guys are awesome to each other. I mean, you punch each other in the face, but you're like really nice about it. (laughs) And he started coming to the ministry and became a leader, became a leader, led us into some incredible things. Uh, I remember on down the line, the last night of that semester, we had a prayer and worship night. So everything the UFC guys hated. Uh, And we sat there and we were praying for each other. And I orchestrated this moment where I said, okay, now we're going to just pray for each other. Uh, We're going to lay hands on each other's shoulders and just say, I'm here for you. And we're going to speak the things of God over you. And we're going to talk to God on behalf of each other. And so I'll never forget one of my favorite moments in ministry was looking back to that back corner where these tough, hardened dudes were sitting with hands on each other's shoulders and, and, and just rallying together and praying for each other, and two of them had, had tears in their eyes. And I just thought, these hardened dudes have been touched by the, the companionship and love of Christians and the grace of God, and that's incredible. There's something real powerful about just stepping out into people's worlds and being a part of their moment. George MacLeod, one of the most influential Scottish pastors to ever live, who was a World War I veteran, incredible human being, said this, I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves. On the town's garbage heap, at the crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. At the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble. Because that is where he died, and that is who he died for, and that is what he died about. And that's where churchmen ought to be, and that's what churchmen ought to be about. And so for me, in my job, 
when I was made to feel like an idiot, when I was mocked in the brunt of jokes, how did I respond after working there for a year? One of my buddies, this another seminary guy that eventually came to work with me in that place, suggested at the end of last semester that we take him to dinner. And I thought, that's going to be real awkward, but okay. And so I got on the phone, and I called him, and I said, hey, man, this is Mike D. I'm here with Brian, and we're about to go grab some food, and we're just wondering if you wanted to join us. And he said, oh, man, I'm out right now. But then he used a, a tone that I'd never heard him use before. It was high-pitched and kind of weird. And he said, can we do it again, though? And then he said, please. And two or three more times before we hung up, he said, seriously, let, let's, let's do this. And I'll never forget one morning in particular. It was just the two of us in the basement, the boss and the low-level guy. And it was never just the two of us down there. It was usually just me and other guys that carried boxes. But it was just the two of us down there. And he started telling me, he said, you know, when my wife was dying of cancer five years ago, no one came to visit us in the hospital. Some guys that I employed, had employed for 10 years when I had been up all night with her, not one of them ever once offered to cover my shift first thing in the morning. And he said, my shop has been here for 30 years. Same customers come in and out every week. He said, no one ever has invited me to dinner. No one's even invited me out for a drink. And he didn't say anything else. He just left it at that. But it was real clear that that gesture was powerful and touched a deep place in his heart. So before I left, I wrote him a little thank you note. Thanks for employing me for the year. It helped me pay for seminary. And by the way, I wrote you a little letter. And you don't have to read it, but I just want you to understand why I'm really studying the things of God, why I left my friends and family back home to be up here. And I just told him about Jesus. This is the beauty of who he is. And the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and it's for you. It's for you. And who knows? We'll see when I get back. But why was Jesus able to remain so calm in the face of opposition? Short answer, love. What's the greatest commandment? Love God and love people. See, Jesus loved God. And his love for God gave him the courage that he needed to not compromise or accommodate morally. He said, God is holy and he has commanded his people to be holy. And I know him. I love him. He's good. He wants the best for me. And so I'm going to continue entrusting myself to him and trusting all the things that he says about the best way to live. And then Jesus loved people. Jesus didn't feel disdain for Matthew. He felt love. Why didn't Matthew feel judged in the face of this incredibly moral man? Why didn't he feel judged? Because he already felt loved. That place in his heart was already occupied. And don't miss the fact that Jesus invites in a tax collector, that he was looked at. Matthew was looked at by people and they looked at him and they thought, this is a man who's responsible for the degradation of our society. Um, He is, in a nutshell, all that threatens to unravel everything about the way that we live and who we are. And Jesus looked at him and he said, you, follow me, follow me. This nobody capitalizing on a broken system for his own lazy, greedy gain. Jesus said, you, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You want to be a part of it? And don't miss that, that Jesus called Matthew in and started discipling him, spending his day with him, spending his life with him, and then eventually, after three years of pouring into him, made him a leader of the greatest revolution that has ever been known to humanity. That Matthew would go on to write one of your four gospels. Don't miss that. That's beautiful. And even as I say that, I know there are people in this room that are thinking, you don't don't get it, man. You're so naive. You have no idea what these people do, what they're responsible for. And Jesus got some pushback too. And he said in verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't he get it? And the disciples don't even get a chance to answer because Jesus apparently overheard it. And in verse 12, but when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus says, this is exactly why I'm here. I'm bringing a kingdom of love, and I'm bringing it for them. 
And Peter, one of Jesus' followers, will write to his particular flock and he'll say, finally, brothers and sisters, most importantly, all of you, be of a humble mind, have brotherly love, and have a tender heart. When you're mocked, don't mock in return. And when you're shown evil, don't do evil back. Rather, bless, for to this you were called. Jesus says, this is why I'm here. And Peter says, and to this you were called. That when we're mocked, that we step out as a blessing. And so I want to close here. I had a friend recently who is an atheist uh, who I love dearly. Uh, Post on my wall uh, an article that had a video in it of a very hateful pastor. Someone that had just finished preaching grace and then just went off on people. And I can't even play it for you. It's too inappropriate. Uh, But my friend who's an atheist who tries to convince me that Christianity is ridiculous and I try to tell him how much Jesus loves him and we just go back and forth on that, posted this video on my wall and he said, see, this is why people have turned away from your faith, why they don't want anything to do with Christianity. And I want to just pause and camp on that for just a second and I want to address two groups of people because I think my friend speaks for many of our friends and some of our family members. And so I want to address two groups of people as we close and the first is to those of you who don't associate with Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the pain and shame and mockery that you've had to endure at the hands of those who claim to follow Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Galatians 1, or, I'm sorry, Galatians 5, nothing counts for anything except for faith working through love. We're meant to be people who trust God and say, in faith, I'm gonna love you no matter what. If it wasn't done in love, it was done in error, and I'm sorry. Second thing I wanna say towards that is that while sometimes I think all Christians should take responsibility for the perverted strands that have emerged from the heart of our faith, I don't count anything that that man said in that video as representative of the core of Christianity. Uh, And sometimes we mess up as Christians. Sometimes Christians, like, a, like an athlete, will have a bad day and have a bad game. Other times athletes will get served some bad philosophy of their sport, go out and act on bad coaching that they've had, and blow it for everyone, and that happens sometimes. And I'm asking you to show us some forgiveness and some compassion. Other times the Bible will say that wolves emerge in sheep's clothing, and these people ought not be seen as representative of the core of Christianity, which is, in essence, lovely. To put it to you this way, if a random guy off the street showed up on Sports Center, put on a Texans uniform and hat, and said, I have an announcement to make on behalf of the Texans. Uh, we're going to start using brass knuckles and shanks in games, and effective immediately, all Cowboys players will be murdered. Thank you very much. See you later. And step off the stage. The Texans would have to get up pretty immediately and maybe even offer an apology for where they may have led that man astray, but they also will say, don't take anything that that man said as part of our core goals or intentions. That doesn't represent us at all. And if you don't hold the Texans responsible for what that man said, then don't hold the Christ of Christianity responsible either for what some people have said hatefully in his name. To those of you that don't know Jesus, I want you to know him. He is kind. His voice sounds nothing like the hateful and judgmental tones that you hear on whatever medium from them, from some of those who bear his name. I want you to know him. Second and last group. To those of you who have been mean in the name of Jesus, I want to say this in love. If you claim Christianity and then you go out and mock, shame, publicly hurt somebody who thinks, acts, or dresses differently than you do, you are far more likely to be the object of God's wrath than they. Jesus came hard at the religious, and he came gentle to the sinners. Go and learn what this means, he says. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Why does Jesus pull out that old phrase, that old rabbinic phrase that, go and learn what this means. It stands for, you don't understand this yet. Go read this passage again and and pray about it till you get it. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Why does Jesus come hard at the religious? He says, because you're misrepresenting me and you're missing the point of your existence. I came to bring a kingdom of love and you're spewing hate. I desire mercy for you and mercy from you. 
He's saying those sacrifices, that religious system, that was meant to remind you that the the blood of something precious was going to have to be spilled in order to pay for what you've done. And you're keeping all the rules of that, puffing out your chest like you're awesome? That doesn't make any sense. You're missing it. I desire mercy for you, self-righteous. And I desire mercy for you, sinner. And I desire mercy from you to the world. See, the world desperately needs Christians who know that they've been shown mercy. And that's the beauty of the cross of Jesus. How could Jesus be so moral and so loving at the same time? The cross. Because in the cross of Jesus, there is justice for the offense. And that should bring us great comfort that nothing that anyone has ever done to you, your parents or a friend or someone out there that has ever done to you that was wrong and that should be paid for will be paid for in the economy of God. No one gets away with anything. There will be justice. But at the cross of Jesus, there is justice for the offense and there is grace for the offender. There's justice for the offense and there is grace for the offender. Jesus says, the penalty for your sin is death. And my love for you is so great that I'll pay that penalty for you. You can pay it yourself or you can trust in this substitute of Jesus on the cross. And so he could step out and he could say, there is mercy for everyone who will trust in me and and look into my eyes and see love for them and grace. Beautiful example of this. I read an article a couple weeks ago in the USA Today And I want to read a portion of it to you. It starts off a little bit rough, but it gets better. It says this. When Christians are in the news, it's usually because they've done something wrong. They've gotten on the wrong side of something or cheated on their wife or worse. What the world rarely gets to see is the powerful grace that flows from a deep faith predicated on the belief that we are all sinners in need of forgiveness. USA Today. The family members of those slain at Charleston Emanuel African Methodist Church bore witness to the central tenet of Christianity last week as the nation gasped in awe. I forgive you. One after another told the stone-faced and unrepentant alleged killer Dylan Roof at his bond hearing. And it's true. You can go on the USA Today website and listen as family members of those slain through sobs say what you did was wrong. And there should be justice for that. You can't be trusted on the street, but I want you to know there's grace for you. I'm a sinner. We've been shown mercy, and we want you to be shown mercy. And they're telling them about Jesus. It's unbelievable. And the nation gasped in awe. This is what the world needs. And this is where you, Christian, come alive. This is why Jesus came, and this is why you are here. Let's pray. Well, Father, we just come to you and we ask and pray, God, that you would give us humble minds, tender hearts, brotherly love. God, as children, I pray that we would imitate our God like a kid imitates a father, that we would look and we would see Jesus in him. There's grace, there's mercy, there's love. May I look like him. May may I be a person who knows that I've been shown mercy and may I show mercy to this world around me. And so if you're here this morning and you just came with a friend or a family or to make somebody that you love happy and you don't know Jesus, I just ask that you would go on a journey, read the revelation about his life, talk to him, pray, look up and behold a king in whose eyes are love. To those of you that do know him, that do claim his name, I pray that you would also look up into his eyes and see a king of love who looks out on you and looks out on this world in love and desires that many would come to know, love, and cherish him. May we be people that honor and imitate Jesus. And I pray that in his holy name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, 
and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Mike DeStefano. He just brought a message called Christians in the Minority, and we we're looking at Matthew 9, a very relevant message today. And in fact, some of the feedback that we got back from the Postscript was just how relevant the message was just to everything as Christians that we are are walking through today. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Glad to, to see you. It's good to get back and have an update on how you're doing. So yeah. we had uh, quite a few questions come in this week. Um, so we'll just kind of jump into them. The first one, just an, an easy question for you is, what was the name of the minister referenced? Um, was it old World War One vet, but we missed the name? Yeah, uh, his name is George McLeod. He okay. was an old Scottish minister and World War One vet. Uh, incredible impact in Scotland there. Great. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned in the message, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about just that shifting of culture where we're beginning to separate from culture um, and just this idea or this fear that the sky is falling and Christianity is going to be a thing of the past and just right. you were going to talk a little bit in Postscript about just some statistics and what yeah. it's how that's shaping up. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, Pew Research just put out some statistics about how Christianity is declining in America. Mainline churches and Catholic churches are decreasing by like 8% per year. And the reaction to that on social media and in a lot of churches was uh, just chaos. You know, everyone sort of assumed this is the beginning of the end. And um, a guy named Ed Stetzer is a statistician and an author uh, who we went to go see as a, a staff mm -hmm. uh, maybe a year ago. And he's done some really fascinating work. And this is all I'll say towards this. Uh, while Christianity is declining in the main line, it's increasing in the evangelical denominations. Mm -hmm. um, church attendance is uh, statistically equal to what it was in the 1940s percentage-wise. So it actually hasn't declined at all. Uh, what's happening is, and what he's saying is, and just for the sake of simplistic numbers, he's saying if from the beginning there was 25% of America that were actually practicing believers. So they were born again, had a conversion experience, it impacted their life in some way, they prayed with their kids, they went to church, whatever, 25% of America. Then, just for the sake of simplistic numbers, say there was another 25% that were atheist or identified as non-Christians. Uh, and he calls that, he calls them the nuns. Mm -hmm. uh, then that means that in the middle, there was a whole 50% that were not quite practicing Christians and certainly not atheists. And that 50% for the first 300 years of Christianity took its cues from the Christians. And many of them were Christian nominally, but it mm -hmm. didn't impact the way that they lived their lives. Now he's saying the shift that we're seeing is the people who were Christians in name only are taking their cues from and identifying themselves, self-identifying themselves as nuns or people mm -hmm. that don't know the Lord. And so what's happening is not that Christianity is declining. Actually, almost nothing is changing. The only thing that's happening is that um, the lines are becoming more clear. Mm -hmm. And now we know who is really a practicing Christian and who's not, uh, which actually I think is helpful for the church. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need to freak out. We don't need to stress out and think that the world's coming to an end. Really nothing is changing except for we have a more accurate perspective on reality. So yeah. I wanted to address that. Yeah, and like yeah. you were saying today, that creates space for us yeah. to move into places and lives of people who are identifying themselves in a different different way now. Absolutely. It makes it clearer for us. Um, so with the relevance of the message, obviously in your workplace, um, even within your families, you're going to have people who don't line up with you, mm -hmm. um, with your values. Um, this person's asking, I think it's a really good question. Um, how can you create a culture of acceptance and value in work when there's there's rude behavior, there's things that are having to be confronted, and mm. so in trying to maintain this balance at work, like how how do you, what advice would you have for that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it sounds like she's a, uh, asking the question from the perspective of a leader or a manager dealing with unsubordinate, insubordinate, uncooperative mm -hmm. people. Um, I'll say something just briefly towards the business side of it and then I'll speak more personally and let other people who are more qualified speak to that. I just think in terms of being a Christian leader in the workplace, uh, it is important to hold your, um, your responsibilities at work and your faith and tension. And um, I think the most important thing as far as addressing insubordinate behavior is first setting expectations and drawing from the, the principles that we see in the Bible and being clear about those expectations up front uh, that certain behavior is unacceptable. I think as a Christian, when we 
talk about, you know, deal with people in love and gentleness and respect, that we think that that means that we can't be stern, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. That wasn't the case with Jesus. I think if we're, if everyone's clear about expectations, and then we say there's a, if the, there's a violation of these expectations and there's consequences, that is more than acceptable as a Christian. The other thing I would say towards that is go find a company that does that well, uh, that's produced some sort of material that will be helpful for you, and that will be much help, more helpful than anything that I will say. Uh, go find a company that you respect, that you're like, man, they do that, fantastic, and then go talk to them uh, and figure out how to do that in your workplace. As an individual Christian, I think we, I said earlier, we have to hold our, um, our responsibilities at work and our faith and tension, and I think uh, the most important thing is that we recognize our faith as primary. And... Uh, though we want to do a good job at uh, being a manager and a leader, we want to, uh, more than that, be a follower of Jesus and a representative of, of who he is and his person. And the one thing that I would speak towards that is uh, the passage in Romans where Paul says, um, as far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all people. And so you do what you can. And I love the, that little, uh, the way he phrases it at the beginning, as far as it is possible with you. So you do everything in your power to be a peacemaker, to create peace, to speak kindness, to speak love. But sometimes people just won't have it, mm -hmm. and that's tough. Um, but your responsibility as a Christian is to, is to trust the Lord and say, I'm going to be a peacemaker and do what I can towards that. Great. That's a good word. And so the next person has um, a lot of the same question, but looking at it from, from a different side, maybe with a family member. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what you said makes sense if you're applying it to someone who's unrepentant, I mean, who is repentive or who is trying to improve or walk better. Um, but what about people in your life that their hearts just seemed hardened? Yeah. Um, how do you step into their world? Um, how do you uh, walk with them in love and not abandon them? Um, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. I think for that person, if they're listening, I would want to point them to the book of First Peter. I think Peter, throughout the entire five chapters of that book, will address that time and again. I want to read just a, a quick section of it that I think answers that question and may help everybody. Okay. Uh, First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13, says, Now who's to harm you if you're zealous for what's good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But honor, your, honor Christ as holy in your hearts always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. So I think three things to that person, that they're dealing with somebody that may be even hostile or at least hard of heart towards their message. Peter gives them three action steps. The first is um, that you have no fear of them, that you recognize in your heart that um, my king has conquered the grave and he's risen to life, and so even in death, there's no harm for me. And so I know that might sound totally disconnected, but it's the, it's the base level of our confidence mm -hmm. that we would look and we'd say, there's nothing that this person could possibly do to harm me. The worst be done to me and I'm okay. Uh, and then we're not troubled. And that speaks, I think, to anxiety, that there's this mm -hmm. sense of uh, turmoil in Worry our soul. And, yeah. and, so, and so Jesus is saying, and Peter is saying, repent of that. Mm -hmm. Don't live in that. If you, if you start to feel that come up, just say, I have nothing to fear. God, you're good. You know their hearts. You know my hearts. And I'm going to trust you. So that's the first thing. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. The second thing is, honor Christ uh, in your hearts. Honor Christ the Lord is holy. And this helps me tremendously. When I start to feel anxiety or I start to feel fear, even about preaching, I think in my heart of Jesus as holy, the beauty of who he was, the perfection of his nature, and the fact that he is seated, enthroned above the heavens. And, and my job and my confidence is him and who he is. And I make much of him. And so that's, that's a valuable step for your soul. And then the third thing, those two are sort of internal. The last one is interpersonal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the last one is going to be always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is within you. Love the way he phrases that. He says, be prepared to make a defense when they ask. So answer in this way. So what he's saying is he's just finished saying, treat everyone with love, with respect, have a humble mind, a tender heart. Um, and so he's saying, that's your action step. You be real kind to them. You be real loving to them. And then pray, beg for an opportunity to speak, but do it as a response. Mm. So when they see your love, when they see there's something different about you and kind about you, and they ask, what is going on with you? Then you're ready. And you go, that's God answering my prayer. For now, I pray, I love the heck out of them. And then when that moment comes, we answer and we do it, he says, key with gentleness and respect. We do it with incredible kindness and respect for them as a human being made in the image of God, but broken like we all are. Great. 
That's great, three steps. And so what are your thoughts on how is it possible and how this looks like to operate this way over a long period of time? Yeah. Um, for like maybe maybe a family member that it's years or a friend that you've been in relationship for years. Um, nothing is changing. You feel like you're doing all three of these things right. How, how can we not feel discouraged mm. or even inadequate yeah. in those moments? Yeah, that's good. I think to answer that, I have a family member who is a non-believer and when I was little, I remember he used to always kind of poke fun at Christianity and so it kind of like weirded me out. Like he was, he just, you know, kind of stood out in that way and I was kind of like scared. Um, but I remember I used to pray all the time that he would come to the Lord. Grew up uh, into college and nothing changed. And um, I remember leaving one time for a trip and telling my friends, hey, I'm gonna spend a lot of time with this family member and if you would just pray for opportunity. And it was right after uh, my, my grandmother passed away and I remember it was the two of us and we were talking in a car or something. And I mean, just out of the blue, he started crying, which was not normal for him. And he just, he asked, um, do you think she's okay? I said, yeah. And he said, do you think she's in heaven? I said, yeah, I do. And he said, how do you know? And I got to in that moment, just mm -hmm. step into what I believe about Jesus. But it was a long time before we got to have a good conversation towards that. And for me, I surround myself with the community of God, continually pray, and then most importantly, honor Christ the Lord and my heart is holy and trust that he is, he's good and he's over all things. And when that moment is right, he'll give me the grace to speak clearly and respectfully. And that he's gone ahead of you in that time, yeah. you know, and prepared those moments or those times when you can be ready to speak into Absolutely. someone's life. Um, Thank you very much for being here with us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you back again soon. Yeah, All can't right. wait to be back. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.